Hello, friends. Patrick McFarlane here of the Liberty Weekly Podcast coming at you with episode, uh, I think it's 83 or 84, uh, but it is the first episode of the Wild Wild Country special that I will be doing with the boys from the Actual Anarchy Podcast. Um, so currently right now, as you all probably know, the show is on indefinite hiatus, and we were kind of brainstorming of ways that we could come up with some really low prep, low preparation, very quick, punchy content. And I had we had all watched this amazing documentary on Netflix called Wild Wild Country about this cult in Oregon. And um, there's it's so rife with content and with uh, state libertarian analysis that uh, we just thought it would make some really, really easy, low effort content that I could just put up on the feed while I'm studying. So uh, without any further ado, I'll hand it off um, to Daniel and Robert of the Actual Anarchy podcast. How are you guys doing? Doing well, sir. Thank you so much. And, and way to sell it. Way to sell it. Uh, we're at the very beginning of this six-part series. And uh, yes, it is low-hanging fruit, but I think it will be very entertaining fruit. And I know Robert, uh, my co-host, who's about to say hello, uh, was really excited when he first watched this series on Netflix. And he's actually in the midst of watching it again. So we're going to do this once a week. Uh, he's going to watch, rewatch an episode. You're going to rewatch an episode. I'm going to be on for emotional support and we'll do this as Liberty Weekly uh, content for your listeners and hopefully get some exposure for our content, which can be found at actualanarchy.com. Uh, we do a podcast where we talk about movies from a Rothbardian and narco capitalist perspective. So this is very similar to what we do in content, but this is a, uh, you know, a, a documentary. We've done one other documentary before or maybe two, but anyway. I'll pass it off to Robert for now, and then we can uh, start diving into this thing. Yeah, hey guys, thanks for having me on. This is Robert from the Actual Anarchy Last Nighters podcast. That's two different podcasts, not just one. Um, yeah, when I saw this documentary on Netflix, I got really excited because like my two prestigious co-hosts here have said, it's chock full of libertarian themes and status themes and religious freedom themes and just all kinds of things like immigration which is a really hot topic in the libertarian circles these days and in status circles these days it's um like with all the uh the abolish ice discussions that are suddenly happening uh you got even you got you got you got politicians making these very vague statements what they always do they they know the the public hates something so they're like yes we must get rid of it and replace it with something that works of course they'll never actually detail exactly what it is they're talking about what would work how it would work how it would solve the problem that they're talking about how it would be different than the current system they just know that they need to placate the masses so they can get votes for the next election but you know it's a, it's a hot topic these days and this this documentary really really addresses that cuz um it's actually kind of immigration is one of the things that they go after the guy for but uh we're here to talk about the very first episode so um if there's no further ado Patrick you want to lead us through it or do you want to get into the uh the Google description and the reviews and that sort of thing yeah, we could do that. Uh, just just one note here. And yeah, I mean, we've been meaning to do this for actually a few months now. But it it's just funny as a note on what you said that, you know, we don't learn anything. This was swept into the dustbin of history. Like I consider myself, you know, relatively aware of historical happenings, as I think we all do. And I had never, ever heard of this. You know, it should be I mean, just with with the sheer intensity of the situation and like the militarized standoff and 
we'll get into all that too. So why don't you guys take it off? And this is uh, episode 83, by the way. So it'll be at libertyweekly.net forward slash 83. Uh, but I'll also do a tag where you can find the whole series at libertyweekly.net forward slash WWC for wild, wild country. So we'll do that one. But you guys got that Google description handy? Indeed, I do. And I also want to throw one other thing out at everyone is that we three are all members of the Libertarian Union, which is a collection of other podcasters. And we have a whole variety from news, music, movie reviews, legal theory, et cetera. And that can all be found at libertarianunion.com. Oh, and also uh, Peace and Liberty podcast and Foreign Policy Focus. So anything that, that wets your whistle can be found at libertarianunion.com. It's good stuff. All right. So let's get into... The Google description. This is one of the tropes we do on the actual Anarchy podcast. So, wild, 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 wild country. Netflix TV series, eight point three on the IMDb, ninety-seven percent Rotten Tomatoes, and ninety-three percent of Google users like it. Here's the description: When a controversial guru builds a utopian city in the Oregon desert, it causes a massive conflict with local ranchers. This docu series chronicles the conflict which leads to the first bioterror attack in the United States and a massive case of illegal wiretapping. It is a pivotal but largely forgotten time in American cultural history that tested the country's tolerance for the separation of church and state. Brothers Mark and Jay Duplass serve as executive producers on this series. Came out March 16th, 2018, starring Rajneesh, Ma Ananchila, Jane Stark, Philip Tolkis, and is six episodes in a series so we are going to do six episodes in our series so that is the google description any thoughts on that robert uh it's fairly straightforward um it's a lot of content to digest but that is essentially the crux of the matter the the main conflict is between the rajneeshis and the citizens of this tiny little town of antelope oregon which is the nearest town to their big muddy ranch, this giant 80,000 acre ranch that they purchase. And it really centers on these, these, these small town folk getting their feathers ruffled by these basically kind of free love hippie types, sort of, but they really do get demonized as a cult and having just weird and bizarre and just strange things goings on and they're just strange ways in which they they meditate and they have sex and all their you know different ideas and one of the main libertarian themes that I'd like to explore is do the residents have a legitimate beef just as a principle for having, you know, a bunch of people, you have a certain culture, right? And then they're essentially invaded. I mean, sure, these people buy this property freely and the, pers the other people sold it freely. But do the these citizens have any right to complain about essentially what is, amounts to a culture claim like we used to have this tiny little town and we liked it peaceful and quiet and then all these young people come in and turn our world upside down do we have a legitimate beef or are they just being snowflakes daniel well i think that is a, a very interesting question because Essentially, what we're talking about is a voluntary market transaction between a buyer and a seller. And then there's some third parties that are, of course, impacted by this. Now, it's often said that when it comes to property rights, you don't actually have a property interest in, say, uh, profits foregone. Say a competitor opens up a store across the street from you. Sure, they've harmed you, but not in an aggressive way. And you did not have a right to those profits. So your profits may be impacted. Uh, I can also see similar uh, things with, say, you have a view you know, from your house, and then someone else builds a, a, a house near you that impacts your view in some way. And I'll defer to Pat on this, our legal scholar, because I'm sure that there are some common law type traditions that have 
come about to resolve such disputes uh, regarding like who's the first user, who's homesteaded it, uh, and other things that impact those areas. But I do think that the townspeople can certainly be pissed off. I just don't know if they have legal remedy and they shouldn't be running to government to go and solve a problem for them that would be akin to, say, a frontier town in you know the 1800s. They strike gold and all of a sudden the little sleepy town quadruples, quintuples in, uh, in population and all of a sudden you're in a bustling metropolis. Do the original people who lived in that town have any gripe, you know, legally against the the inrush of of people who have come to that area and, and built it up into a larger city? I kind of think not. Uh, so I'll defer to Pat on the rest of this. Yeah, I'm not certainly not an expert in this area of the law, but there usually the answers would be kind of covenant communities with um, or like uh, easements or or it'd be more probably more appropriately a covenant where you would have like a promise that would run with the land or covenant communities um, or homeowners associations. Although these things are so combined with government right now, a big way that they like to do it is with zoning. And so you'll really get <clears throat> in the status lexicon and there's actually a big push against zoning right now in law school. I think a progressive push against zoning laws, but so how it works now, you know, you would have a zoning law that would say, well, no building in this area can be 35 feet, or you would have maybe someone who would get a conveyance and there would be restrictions. The, the land would be burdened somehow or something like that. But the interesting case that we see here with wild, wild country is just people fighting over the power of government. And, um, I, I tend to be very much against both parties because they both suck. Like uh, the Rajneeshis are kind of, they suck. And also the townspeople suck, I think, because uh, essentially in the beginning, what it is, is <clears throat> who runs first to big daddy government? Because these, so essentially I think Antelope was a, like a ghost town. There were only 50 people living there, mostly retirees. The sign says 40 population of 40. And you know, it's it's not because they're the minority is why they suck, but they this uh, this big big money ranch was like nineteen or 20, 20 miles away from Antelope, and I, it's the townspeople that move first to try and evict the Rajneeshis. Am I correct in that? Yes, you're absolutely correct. It's the it's the townspeople who objected to the Rajneeshis because at the first the Rajneeshis were just buying property, and it was only when the the townspeople moved to get government to declare that the buildings they were building on their ranch were somehow illegal and they tried to get the um essentially they wanted to make the the ranch into a city is that correct i believe yeah and then that was like they wanted to make that deemed like illegal and they wanted to have the government come in and knock all their buildings down essentially yeah i think that they had them um unincorporate the city so they they essentially said you don't have the right to incorporate even though you've already incorporated we're going to force you to de-incorporate and that's what then drove the arajnishis to descend into antelope and, and buy all the property <laughs> buy all the property become residents become eligible to vote in the local election and outnumber you know democracy yay right uh to win the uh, positions of mayor and city council and something along those lines, or not the mayor, but the majority of the positions in the city council so that they could then have their buildings be built and qualify for the other uh, accommodations to government regulation that were required to have the buildings up in the ranch. So yeah, so this Daniel, a reaction so Daniel to Im imposition of government. And then they used the tools of government against the townspeople. So in this, what we're just, what we're initially discussing right here, even though this doesn't take place in episode one, we apologize, but it's an interesting discussion, so we're going to do it. Because the Rajneeshis are acting defensively in this situation to protect the buildings that they built and the land that they built and they were developing, do you give them a pass? 
in their efforts to, you know, use the mechanism of government to defend themselves? Or do you think that they're acting immorally also, like Patrick seems to be doing? You know, that that's a that's a great question. It's almost akin to defensive voting. Um, Indeed. Reminds me of our conversation with Adam Kokesh on our Idiocracy episode. I think it was episode 30 of our show where he basically said in response to me saying, I, I think that voting is violence. He was like, well, it's sort of like a firearm, you know, it can be used for evil purposes, but can also be used for defensive purposes and, and good purposes, you know? And so it really depends on what's downrange. You know, what is, what is the target you're aiming at when you're using voting? And in this instance, yeah, I kind of think that the Rajneeshis were sort of backed into a corner and out of the available options, this one was the most viable and expedient to defend their right to build buildings on their land. So, yeah, a bit of a pass. Uh, uh, have we convinced you change your mind at all, Pat? Um, well, I think to their credit, it is a matter of, you know, they are reaching for if, you know, democracy is the loaded gun in the room. They are reaching for it second because uh, it was the townspeople themselves. So I think in the townspeople are morally blameworthy because of that, because they reach for the loaded gun. But um, the Rajneeshis are not technically without blame for trying to protect themselves in that way. I think the way that they do it is pretty cheeky, and I actually kind of appreciate it. But later on, we'll see what happens. The actions they take later on um, were really, really bad, and I think maybe going worse than the townspeople were. Well, they clearly were. I mean, they were poisoning people and drugging people and um, firebombing things, right? So, <laughs> um, well, it, it's funny. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that just because it's true. That's what they do. But you know how the legal violence of the state and voting is perfectly legal and yeah. understood and accepted. But the actual, you know, down in the dirt physical violence that the Rajneeshis do is you know demonized and obviously vilified correctly but it's just it's funny that the the violence of the voting of the state does just completely gets a pass yeah because that's sterilized and you know it's degrees of separation like Larkin right. says when yeah when police off he's seen police officers do something and he says why do you do that and he says well i didn't do it the law did it you know i didn't ransack your car the law did it i'm just carrying out the law so they physically don't have that connection. Yeah, and if anything, even though that the Rajneeshis do physical violence and harm with intent, mind you, uh, I almost give them a bit more, respect's not the right word, but at least they're the ones taking the individual risk in that act versus the townspeople voting, and it's like a total absolving of any responsibility. It's just pushing a button and the violence happens whether they recognize it or not. And that it's had very little cost to themselves. And I really, really enjoyed that they go to government and then it gets turned against them and then they're unhappy with the result. Yeah. And they look for ways yeah. and ways to, well, they must have cheated somehow. <laughs> it just blows up right in their face. Um, okay, well, I, let's. Uh, we're going a little past the scope of episode one, so I want to kind of steer it back, but... Um, at the same time, I wanted to remind everyone that we have been recording ever since we started talking, and there was some really juicy nuggets in the Patreon content. So I would check that out. Uh, that'll be out there as well. So, um, And how do people find your Patreon content, Pat? Patreon.com forward slash Liberty Weekly. Yep, that's the place. Thanks to Devin, our newest patron. But um, yeah, so this episode one was a lot about the the Raj, just the Rajneeshis themselves and what they believe. And kind of, we kind of went over the aspects of the staples. He wanted to bring 50,000 people in the desert, Rajneesh said. Um, so let, let's go through the history of that. So who is Rajneesh? Let's answer that question. All right. Well, I'll, I'll try to take a hack at it. So Bhagwan Rajneesh was a, is a guru. And I don't, the the documentary doesn't really explain what he was doing before he was about say i don't know he looked like at least 50 yeah something like that yeah but he was a guru back in the 60s and the 70s and then later into the 80s 
and he seemed to he was a guy he's basically a, your kind of like your Karl Marx type or some other kind of cult sort of leader guy he had a vision for what mankind was what mankind could be and he was there around the time when a lot of people in the West and say like the hippies and like, I remember when the Beatles went over to India, they were all kind of seeking this spiritual enlightenment because they were kind of rejecting the, I don't know if it was necessarily the capitalist world of their parents or what, but they were rejecting who knows what, maybe like Western materialism. And they were searching for more of a spiritual grounding and it seemed like that the Rajneeshi really provided that. And he sort of melded the two worlds together. He was a, a guru that believed in capitalism and materialism and spirituality and sexuality. And I thought it was really interesting, um, this quote. Um, he was aware of other communes. And that they had all died because they had this stupid idea that you shouldn't create wealth. There was a lot of rejection of wealth, seeing that as evil. Even today, you've got like Democratic Socialist, this lady that just got elected. And she's saying that, you know, profit is evil. There's a lot of that going around. And there was a lot of that going back around back then. But Rajneeshi rejected that to his credit. And he was allowed, and he's, it allowed him to, I mean, in the, the embracing of creation, of creating value, of creating wealth, it allowed him to be very successful, and it allowed the Rajneeshis to be a very successful force. I mean, they didn't just form some hippie commune out in the desert somewhere, and, you know, nobody does the dishes, and nobody changes, you know, does the laundry, and everything just falls to shit really fast. These guys were more industrious. They were like a little colony of ants, all working and contributing. And yeah, they had their interesting different ways, but I did appreciate their industriousness, their embracing of uh, capitalistic values into that wealth and wealth generation. Yeah, well, and many of them were um, professionals, weren't they? These uh, like young Western Europeans that would travel to India, and um, so it, it it really starts with yeah, Rajneesh. And I I was so surprised by how he how straight up it's a business. You know, I think that was from from the very get go. As soon as um, Manan Sheila, who is his his psychopathic or sociopathic secretary, who's basically pulling the strings behind the curtain she runs everything and he's just the the leader he's the figurehead um but even she is like yeah this is a business you know rajneesh enterprises and we're providing this product which is enlightenment and uh we have all these young westerners come in so what do you guys think about that i'll, I'll throw it off to daniel yeah i really do appreciate how industrious they were and treating it like a business and, you know, it's one of those things could, that could very easily fail. You know, anytime you get a group of people together and you're not using monetary exchange, uh, things can get dicey pretty quickly. Like um, we tried to have a community garden across the street and certain people were putting in more work. Others were putting in less work. Certain people were taking more produce and other people were getting less. And tempers began to fray uh, over the course of a few months. And so just at the scale of this thing, um, you can only imagine how much they had to uh, uh, have a common vision to be able to hold it together. And it was amazing how they were, I think this was all in episode one, where they were building uh, vast domiciles, vast structures. There was an airport put in, there were apartment buildings, there was the Rajneesh's um, large house, and, and then Sheila was in a large house. And it was just a, a kind of an amazing feat to get something like that created 20 miles outside of the nearest podunk town in bumfuck, Oregon. And, you know, that's another thing I wanted to ask you guys is if you can't go in the middle of nowhere, Oregon, and establish essentially what could be considered an encapistan uh, in a way, um, where can you go? 
right? Like they they went out of their way to not be in other people's space. You know, they they sought out solitude with which they could then develop their property according to the vision that they had. And that just it just strikes me that that wasn't permitted. And I don't yeah. mean permitted in, you know, a, here's my permit. <laughs> I mean, he's like not allowed, you know, it's like they, they went out of their way to, to make that uh, uh, work as well as possible for everybody. But go ahead, Robert. Well, yeah, I'm just going to jump off on what you're saying. It very much seemed like that. It seemed like the locals were kind of really curious about what they were doing because the Rajneeshis, they build up this entire area, turning it into essentially a city. And at the beginning, you know, they're following all the rules and the laws and they're getting incorporated. And then they start, you know, essentially closing down the roads or they one. There was one kind of throwaway line by a lady who said that they tried to close down the roads and the the antelope people saw that as suspicious as why are you trying to close down the roads? Why can't we go in there and check it out? We want to see what you're doing. The Rajneeshis are basically like, hey, we don't want to mess with anybody's shit. We're not going to fuck up your shit. We're going to do our own shit. We're going to, we got this airport. We're just going to kind of keep to ourselves. Just leave us alone and everything will be cool. But it like the, the Antelopians just stuck their nose in and they're like, no, you got to do what we say and you just, we just can't leave you alone. And yeah, it was, uh, where can you go? Where can I don't know, man. Yeah, not in the United States. Oh, well, I think it's funny that the um yeah, and the whole reason why he wanted to come to the United States is because I think in India they realized that his commune was kind of setting up a more attractive competing government in a certain <laughs> way. Like they they said that, you know, all of India was just destitute and in squalor and all of a sudden here's his um, ashram and it's like this pristine beautiful place with everyone working hard behind these walls and stuff yeah I think in episode one they said that they actually sought out the United States because of the constitution and the respect for property rights that existed and it was one of the few places in the world where they thought that they could even attempt uh, what they tried here because India the, the authorities in India were um, not happy with what he was doing. So he was sort of being forced out of India. Well, and it's funny that the guy in Antelope, um, the main thing that he thought to, yeah, his first thought was, and I think this was the guy that infiltrated the city council after the, the Rajneeshis took it over. But he said everything was fine with them until Ma Nan Sheila shows up, this lady pulling strings behind behind the scenes. So I, I think that's interesting that he chose that moment and not the moment that the Antelopian townspeople tried to kick the Rajneeshis out. Um, so I don't know what coincided with Manan Sheila showing up. Um, so, but but we have this res revolving cast of characters that represents the Rajneeshis. So on one hand, we have Bhagwan, uh, the the guy himself, Rajneesh, and. It's his uh, secretary behind the scenes, Manan Sheila. But then there is the former attorney for Bob Guam, um, Rajneesh. And he was a very interesting character, too. And he kind of tells the story as well from his standpoint. And then there was the another perspective from this lady who lived in Australia who dropped everything with her family to come live in in India first, and then she followed them to the United States. And I think there was another person, another guy who was the CEO of Rajneeshi Corporation, the the actual, it's called Rajneesh International, Neo the Neo Balance Corporation. So, um, Robert, I guess I'll throw this off to you, but um, you, you know about, I, I'm not very versed in like new age stuff. I just don't know anything about that. So you guys live on the West Coast. You tell me about new age stuff. <laughs> well, you live on the West Coast, so you must know about it. Yeah, right. Yeah, we're, we're actually fairly geographically close to where this all took place. And then, yeah, growing up in the 80s, I don't remember this at all. But um, 
I did grow up in a family with uh, a mother who sought, you know, rejected um, the Catholicism that she grew up with. And she actually sat down once she was married and analyzed all the different religions. And she chose a, the, the religion of Baha'i, which may or may not be familiar with. They're, it's a very small sect. Um, it's kind of its own thing, but it's fairly similar. I don't know in belief structure or anything like that, but it's a, it's a re- recent thing. Um, I think it was started in like the 1800s, like the late 1800s. And it, that always kind of fascinates me. I think something, you know, when a religion starts new, it's always, it is most vulnerable. You know, once they get a full head of steam, then they kind of got a little like credibility to go with the, you know, their, their, their ideas. But the new age movement, and I can't really speak authoritatively to this. I, I'm not, I, all I can do is give you my perspective. I mean, I remember growing up and, you know, meeting people that believed in like crystals and, um, <laughs> there's actually one time, <laughs> I'm not going to tell the whole story, but one time I got invited out to a, an island where there was like this new age speaker lady and she s- said all kinds of fun, interesting things. Like, um, you know, she got her messages from her deity through the pineal gland, and that's why she kept her hair long. There was, uh, the moon is fake, and it's um, artificially made to make women menstruate every 30 days. All kinds of fun ideas, all wrapped up in, I think, Atlantean mythology and uh, sacred geometry type ideas. Lots of fun stuff. But I associate all that kind of stuff, kind of lump it in together with people just kind of rejecting rejecting normal Christianity, like the Christianity they grew up in. They're like, well, this is bullshit. There's got to be more to it than just this. So maybe, maybe crystals are magic. Maybe incense is going to cure my cancer. I don't know um, exactly where it all stems from, but it definitely stem, It seems to stem to me, from a rejection, not necessarily outright, but from, like, you want to add to these other religious ideas or, you know, partially reject this and add to, kind of like the the way the Native Americans did when the early missionaries came over. They had, you know, a certain number of gods, and they're like, well, here's another god. And they're like, oh, okay, more gods, great, more power for us. Daniel, you got any uh, thoughts? I remember your mom having some some kind of similar type of things. Maybe not these days, but maybe growing up. Well, you you actually probably remember better than I do. But I do want to throw some psychology stuff in here because some of the procedures and rituals that the Rajneeshi or that, what are they called? The, um, some, the Rajneeshis? The san, Sanyasins do. Yes. Oh, the Sanyasins. Okay. Yeah, so they go through a series of um, meditation and then convulsive dancing and chanting and things like that. And they they breathe very heavily, like almost a hyperventilation. And all of these different stages that they go through, they elicit a physical response, which triggers um, like certain things in their mind to, to make it more uh, more indelible. So they're actually creating experiences that make it stick so it's almost like a ritualized initiation process and it does give them a a euphoric feeling and and a change in um, how they feel and so that can be equated to oh it's working it's sort of like a placebo effect if it were and uh, so i i can totally see how they were able to sell or peddle this concept as a religion and to get people to buy into it because they actually do feel different as a result of doing these things. They, there, there is a sensation there. And of well, course, Daniel, the Daniel, platitudes are all you, great, right? Daniel, have you ever done the, um, I forget what the name is, but there's some sort of, it's a breathing technique, which is essentially a lot of rapid, heavy breathing. And then there's some like slower breaths, but then it's a lot of rapid, heavy breathing again. Well, that you was more my, about? my wife uh, twice for for the two kids, but yes, yeah. but yeah, I get where you're going with this. 
Yeah. So anyway, there's some technique and I know there's, there's like gurus and they teach breathing classes, but I did it one time and I can attest to what you're saying. It is absolutely a way to you high oxygen gets you high. And if you rapidly oxygenate the blood, you will feel well, just incredible. And I can imagine why you would then, you know, kind of have some sort of transcendental experience or really focus in on what it is they're saying, or really just like, like you said, having a, having a, some kind of experience and really remembering and an indelible moment with this, these people. And it's, you know, something completely new and different that these Westerners are really searching out for. And here they find it. And it, yeah, it's not surprising that they latched on. And then when they turned it into a commodity and they, hell, they even had a bank, you know, I mean, they're going to, they're going to do all right. Yeah. And this reminds me of our uh, old discussions on your basketball court growing up when we were solving all the world's problems. We said, you know what we need to do? We need to come up with a religion because that's where you make money. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, and <clears throat> So, are you still with me? And we're back. And okay. we're back. We had a little uh, break up there, but well, I, I don't want the. Like I was saying these these episodes shouldn't be any longer than the actual episodes themselves. So maybe let's just close on a little analysis of how the the structure actually works of these companies or of of the the Rajneeshis themselves. So we were saying they had a bank. Um, it sounded like all these white collar people kind of move in. And they loan their money to the company itself, to the Rajneesh International. So basically, they give up all their earthly possessions and loan it to Rajneesh. And then they report to the job office and get a job. So you guys tear that apart. I'll throw it to Daniel first. Yeah, I, I don't remember the specific mechanism, but it seemed like it dawned on them at some point that they had a sufficient following that if they needed money, they could just ask for the money to be loaned to them, and it could somehow um, be used to sort of amplify the effect of that money. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit fuzzy on, on the mechanism, but it allowed them to get a start in creating or purchasing the land and uh, creating viable things that then could be sold and peddled. And they he resulted in having, what, 19 Rolls Royces? Yeah, and sure. Some of that was for show, but they had the money to do it. Right. And your point about the um, white collar Westerners going and being part of this uh, Rajneeshi um, Sanyasin, they were also lending their expertise. He had architects and city planners and uh, building contractors and lawyers and doctors and all sorts of people joining the community and lending their services uh, in kind to serve that community. So it's sort of this blend of socialism and the market. And for a short time, it appeared to be working. Uh, and I'll pass it off to Robert for a little bit more before we wind down. Well, it is fun to think of the Rajneesh as an entrepreneur. And I don't know if he, he the Western money kind of fell into his lap or if he actively sought it out. It's not necessarily made clear. Um, you know, he wrote a couple of books and then he would give like these discussions in stadiums. And yeah, it seemed like they they made it like a they had an aha moment when they had all these this Western money coming in. And they're like, wow, we should really do something with this and we really can do something with this. And I, I wonder if his message changed over the years, or if he was right from the get-go, a staunch, you know, this is a product, we're selling it, and you're buying it, and you're going to get some sort of enlightenment out of it. Um, one last thing before we wrap up for the day. I, 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 I just want to mention that, to me, it seemed like the Rajneeshis, you know, drank the Kool-Aid on the U S constitution being able to protect them. Mm -hmm. It yeah. struck me as a very naive move 
I don't necessarily blame them, but I wouldn't make that mistake if I were them. If if I had been there with what I know now, counseling them, I would say, do not pin your hopes on politician scribbles. It doesn't end well. It it the U.S. Constitution hasn't been able to do hardly anything in its history. It's supposed to have this nice limited form of government that's checks and balances. And what do we have today? So uh, it's, it's a nice idea that they want to go somewhere where they at least pay lip service to protecting religious freedoms. But ultimately, when the rubber meets the road, you see the, the mechanism of government being used against those, those things. So that's it for me. Pat, you want to you wanna close this one out? Yeah, I think that's good. I think we got a really good start on the first episode of Wild Wild Country. And I mean, there's so much that we could really pick at here. And we have six whole episodes to do it. So um, at, at one point, I wanted to talk about like, does a social contrast contract of sorts, if a real social contract exists here with the Rajneeshis, is there some kind of like consideration and like... Um, consideration is like just a legal term for it's the glue that holds a contract together which is like the bargain for exchange of the parties so each party is knowingly and voluntarily giving something up to receive something else so is rajneesh offering enlightenment and in return you know each individual uh rajneesh is offering you know pl they're pledging their money and their labor and it's all voluntary is this some kind of anarcho syndicalism and I think maybe that's a theme that we just want to keep in mind going forward as we tackle kind of the topics of each episode. So come back next week to find yeah. out the answer. The answer. Um, so in this episode, we introduce you to the Rajneeshis, the townspeople. We introduce kind of the whole story, the backdrop of it. And the episode ends with um, Bhagwan actually arriving in Antelope. And it ends with a shot of him walking down the street in Antelope, and there's this black guy that's standing there, and he's like, "What? <laughs> Did you get that shot?" Yeah. Oh, that was my favorite. Well, because the Rajneeshis are like, they're making this, you know, red carpet essentially with like these flowers, and you know, like Bhagwan can't step on like common dirt, and they're just like, never seen that before. <laughs> yeah. So it was it was real great. Um. But yeah, so you can find this episode at libertyweekly.net forward slash 83 or the whole category at libertyweekly.net forward slash WWC for Wild Wild Country. And I'll leave it to you boys to plug your um, actual anarchy and libertarian union. All right. Thank you, Pat. This has been a lot of fun. Episode one of six. So we'll be back each week until our demands are met. Uh, to borrow a little bit of true lies. That's one, <laughs> that's one great movie. Uh, so speaking of movies, we talk about movies from a Rothbardian and narco capitalist perspective on the actual Anarchy podcast. We also have a normie friendly version that you can share with friends and family that might be off put by the Anarchy in the name. And that is called The Last Nighters. So you can find that version at lastnighters.com. It's a slightly shorter version. It doesn't have the uh, beginning and end that we do for speaking with our anarchist audience. But it uh, basically has, you know, the meat of the story. And our analysis is still there in the middle, unchanged. Uh, we don't hold back. We don't pull any punches. Uh, I think that we're fun and interesting to listen to. But, you know, that's my own perspective. And uh, uh, what else can we say? Um, oh, we're also part of the Libertarian Union, as is Pat. Um, and uh, that has a collection of other podcasters. And libertarianunion.com is where you find that. And I'll pass to Robert. Hey, I just want to thank everybody for listening. This should be a, a fun series. I was really taken by it and the, the plight of these Rajneeshis and the, the mistakes they make and the kind of situations that they're kind of forced into. I mean, yeah, you could argue that they could just turn around and leave, but, you know, they say the same thing to us ANCAPs and Libertarians. Like, if you don't like it, leave. Well, why should they leave if, if, if it's the people of Antelope that suck? So... Yeah, I mean, you know, were they pushed to do what they did? Yes. Did they take it too far? Well, we'll talk about that in the next episode. Thanks yeah. for listening. That's a good lead in there. And um, we're after we 
after we stop and even from before we started this conversation, we have tons of bonus content. And I think what I want to talk about is how me and Daniel and Robert, like the actual Anarchy podcast is one of the first podcasts that me and my co-host Jerry um, interacted with. So this is coming back to the roots like a year ago when this started. So tune in for that conversation that we're about to have right now. So thanks for joining us, guys. Peace.